Welcome back to another episode of What's On Your Mind. I've got Jason McDonald and Antonia Isa joining me on the call today, and we've got a great show planned for you guys, so I'm looking forward to getting into that straight away. Jason, Anthony, welcome back. Uh, so I just wanted to kick off the show, really, by mentioning, obviously, we've seen a bit of a rebound in equity indices and a decline in, in yields as well. And it kind of seems like that's all suggestive of the market really anticipating looser monetary policy from central banks. So I just wanted to get your guys' opinions on that to start off with. I mean, uh, Jason, what, what do you make of all of that? Yeah, um, I think you've brought up a good point. Um, you know, I mean, at the moment, I am, I, I think it's unavoidable um, to be very cognizant of what the macro picture is looking like. You, you, you know, with all the stuff that's going around and in terms of um, expected Fed interest rate cuts, um, obviously the trade war um, just never goes away. It's like Brexit. It's the gift that keeps on giving. Um, but so, you know, in connection with that, I've actually been hearing at stroke reading um, some things recently about a so-called melt-up. Um, a melt-up is the opposite to a, a stock market crash, and it's where you get a very rapid um, rise in the stock market. And the analogy is, is back to 1998-99. And for those of you who um, who weren't around in those days, um, He's, sorry, Anthony and I both were, so um, because we're relatively senior. Um, just to sort of recap what was going on at that time, 1997-98 uh, was, um, was the Asian financial crisis and also when Russia defaulted on its, on its bonds, which are known as GKOs. Um, at that time, the ruble dropped 70%. Uh, in September 1998, a, a real sort of... Um, memorable moment occurred for, for all of us old geezers, which is that long-term capital management failed, which was a, a hedge fund that had no less than three Nobel Prize winners um, as its principles, um, massively levered. Um, and um, the systemic risk from that situation was, was, was judged to be sufficiently significant that the Fed actually intervened um, and, and initiated a bailout for um for the fund so what happened between july and october of that year 1998 was us the us stock market dropped 19 percent at the end of september the fed actually started to uh, cut rates um and the stock market ended up bottoming bottoming around mid-october 1998 from then onwards it rallied hard almost 50 percent up into the summer of 1999 uh now interestingly enough Economic activity over that period in the US was actually extremely strong. Um, and this is where I'm, I'm going to draw the contrast and start drawing some differences between 1998 stroke 99 and 2019, because I don't um, I, I think there are a lot of flaws in this kind of melt up argument. Um, so number one um, was that in the 1998 period, in the lead up to that, Fed funds were actually approximately flat for two and a half years. Um, so the opposite to um, to where we are now, where coming into 2019, the Fed has actually been raising rates um, for two years. And as we know, the effects of interest rate increases and decreases are lagged. So you could argue, in fact, very strongly that the effects of of the two years of Fed hikes has yet to fully show up in the economic numbers. That's quite different from 98. Um, secondly, in 1998, the yield curve was flat. It did not invert. Now, if you remember end of last year, one of the things that got people excited, uh, stroke scared, was the inversion of the yield curve. Look at three-month, 10-year spreads now in US Treasuries. You're looking at a, 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 a very clear inversion. Um, three-month rates, 2.29%. 10-year rates, 2.16%. That's an inversion. Uh, number three, um, 1998, we had no fiscal tightening. Um, coming into this year, because the effects of the tax cuts from last year are now starting to dissipate, we've effectively got going into next year uh, an up to 80 basis point of GDP fiscal tightening. Okay. Uh, number four, the really obvious thing here is the tariff situation. 
Um, that has certainly been a drag on global growth. We did not have the tariff situation in 1998. Um, but I think, you know, the most important and, and the fifth factor here, the difference between now and 1998-99, is that um, in 97, so the year before the Asian crisis, the GKO default, etc., 10-year uh, treasury rates actually dropped 3% across early 97 through until late 98. Now, that was actually the foundation of the economic recovery, which came into play in 98, 99. So if you remember what I said earlier on, that if monetary policy effects lag and they take sort of one and a half to two years to actually show up. So the Fed funds cuts of 98, late 98, you could argue actually were not responsible for the economic recovery. It, it, the seeds were already sown previously. Um, now, in a way, those rate cuts were, were pro-cyclical, whereas what we have now is a very different situation where we've got economic activity having peaked in the middle of last year. We've got slowing in all kinds of indicators that, that people have spoken about in previous issue, uh, editions of What's On Your Mind. So I'm not going to go over that again. But we are, we've still got arguably another six, seven, eight months of slowing to come. So rate cuts now, which of course the market is strongly expecting, and in fact will probably have a tantrum if they don't come, soon um we're actually th these are going to be counter cyclical uh fed rate cuts if they happen and also you know i mean th as an aside i would argue about the certainty with which the market is expecting two or three rate cuts this year and how quickly that's a separate discussion um but it seems to me that you know we're in a very th we're in a very different situation from 98 99 um, and I think actually, Anthony, you've you've been looking at some fund flows, which have been really interesting as well, right? In terms of uh, what some of the major institutional money has been doing. Jason, yeah, you're spot on. Uh, there's a chart that uh, Chris will pop up on the screen now, showing equity outflows uh, over the last six months, and this is raw dollar numbers. So it's two two hundred and forty billion or thereabouts, and that money is uh, moving into uh, money market funds and bond funds. And this is serious risk off scenario. There hasn't been outflows over a six month period like that ever. Um, now it is dollar terms. So uh, in percentage terms or assets under management terms, it's, it's not the biggest of all time, but it's pretty close to it. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. And that's a that's just a headwind um, that a melt up is going to struggle to work its way through as well, I would have thought, Jason. and. You mentioned uh, long-term capital management. Uh, I know this isn't a book review show. Uh, however, uh, When Genius Failed is a is a fantastic book for some of our younger viewers out there that weren't around. Uh, I mean, many of them weren't around for the financial crisis, let alone uh, back in 1998. But it's well worth reading to understand um, behavioural issues, uh, particularly uh, when you think you're smarter than the market. Um, so anyway... That's a, a small aside. One other underlying factor that I've uh, been looking at a little bit recently has been uh, global semiconductor sales. Right. Now, it's a key component, obviously, of uh, you know, the, the, the industrial world. Um, it's got a short cycle uh, and uh, the upgrades come through quite quickly and, and firms usually upgrade across the board when they can uh, to be at that point in. They've fallen off a cliff, um, down 24% since the October high, uh, down 14.5% or so since this time last year. Uh, and there's a couple of reasons for that. And these are reflective of that underlying sort of economic potential, you know, sort of potential weakness that we're seeing and feeling. Um, and some of it is around what you talked about with the tariffs. Uh, so you've had Chinese buyers of US uh, uh, chips pre-ordering. Uh, when the first signs of this, uh, uh, particularly the China component of uh, the trade war started happening, there was massive amounts of front-loading, pre-ordering from Huawei and a whole range of uh, Chinese uh, companies that use use these chips. Uh, and they've got stockpiles. And 
you know, to their credit, um, unfortunately, that's been shown to, you know, they're going to need these stockpiles because there's lots of U.S. businesses not doing business with them. But that's, a, you know, a huge amount of demand that's now out of that system and, and uh, was brought forward into 2018. Um, mobile phone sales, as anyone who follows the tech sector, you will have seen Apple sales are, are down, Samsung and Huawei as well, also down there, the one and two player. Uh, so demand's gone from there. Demand's come out of the PC market uh, as well. And although it's quite niche, it was driving a lot of demand, particularly for NVIDIA chips. And the crypto mining space uh, has slowed significantly, picking up a fraction now. Um, but compared to where we were in 2018, uh, that demand's just all disappeared. It will come back at some stage. But my worry is that there's a whole range of other industries that have brought forward uh, purchases, uh, building inventory in anticipation of tariffs coming on, whether they be US companies or Chinese companies. And we know that's happened. Um, if you look through uh, manufacturing surveys, you will see people who have said we're worried about future tariffs. They've bought steel. They've bought a whole range of things in anticipation. That's drawing forward demand, if you see end demands at the same time, then, you know, the economic numbers could change quite quickly. So I was hoping um, that, you know, we could go on here and talk about a few stocks, um, but it's really the big that is at front of mind for, for me and everyone that I talk to at the moment, uh, and, that's the, and that's the macro side of things. Yeah, so, I mean, I totally agree with that, Anthony. I, I think it's, it's impossible to... Um, to just look in isolation at single stock ideas without looking at the general macro picture at the moment. It's it's so important and there are so many developments taking place. Um, clearly, with everything that's going on with Fed expectations, um, trade wars, etc., basically you can't ignore the macro picture. It has to be incorporated at the moment. Yeah, that's right. So the mentees that uh, that I'm working with at the moment are very focused on that macro picture, trying to get an understanding of what's going on there and a focus on risk management in this sort of environment as well. Those big moves, um, if they get those wrong, how that impacts their portfolio. Yeah. So we want to focus on stocks and we're still sort of doing that, but it's really been for me and my mentees bringing in of the number of stocks that we've got, um, the size of the exposure, and, and trying to manage a little bit of risk. Well, you know what? You mentioned something really interesting there because the way the market has been moving with, um, you know, you're talking about, uh, you're kind of um, alluding to getting on the wrong side of the big moves because at the moment the, the, the moves are, they're, they're so quick and they're so one way over short-term time period. So, you know, let's just look at last week where you had a week where equities went up, government bonds went up, and gold went up. Um, I mean, you know, this is not what we're used to seeing in terms of our, you know, if you look back over our very long um, history, it's, these are slightly unusual markets. You know, somebody somewhere in one of those asset classes or more has got it wrong in the short term. And, you know, in terms of what you were saying about the moves, you're absolutely right, because, you know, you have to be very careful here not to top and tail uh, where, where people are, you know, essentially getting bearish at the bottom of a 10 percent correction and they're getting bullish at all time highs. Um, and that is the classic, as we've seen over decades, um, the, the, the sort of topping and tailing experience that, um, you know, shall we say, the less experienced um, tend to follow. Um, and you really can get whipsawed around. So one thing that I've also noticed is not just, um, you know, the fact that the market tends to trend in one way um, day after day for periods. So, you know, if you if you read the main, if you look at the mainstream media, the mainstream financial media, which, of course, is relatively simplified and, and needs stories, um, you know, we're looking we, we go from one week where it's like, oh, my goodness, um, we've just had um a record number of weeks in the positive to now we've got a record number of days of the S&P or the Dow, or whatever it is, dropping. And you're, get, you're going from one of these things to the next and then back again. And But what I did find interesting was that amongst all the noise last week of everything rallying, 
was that actually XLP and XLU, these are ETFs on defensive sectors in the US. One is the is consumer staples, that's the XLP. XLU is the utilities ETF. Now, these things have rallied in line with the S&P um, since the, the troughing at the end of last year around Christmas time. They've rallied in line, more or less, and they've also actually rallied stronger from their lows last week um, than the general market did, and they're hitting all-time highs now. Now, that really, that, that I think wasn't widely publicized. I certainly wasn't reading it myself, uh, generally commented on. I think that's an interesting um, situation in terms of the composition of what we're seeing as well. Not So not just the fact that the market has, has obviously had a strong rebound, and treasury yields are going lower, et cetera, et cetera. But also that composition of of where funds are flowing into, and you obviously goes back to what you've been talking about with fund flows and volumes. And you know, there might there are probably people out there saying, well, you know, if this is the case, then why is the market still going up? Um, and well, you know, I heard a, re- a rather trite comment, which actually sort of slightly rang true to me. It's like, well. Maybe when the companies um, are in their quiet, in their closed periods, and therefore they can't be executing on their stock buybacks, maybe that's when we're going to see a pullback. Now, obviously, that was a bit of a joke, but actually, you cannot uh, exaggerate the power of corporate buybacks here. I mean, these 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 buybacks—they are literally—they're not price sensitive. They're not talk, they're not looking at P ratios and the economics. They are just like machines. Um, and I think that's, you know, that's an interesting situation along with the compositions. Um, now, lastly, what I did want to talk about was um, was a very kind of uh, early stage nascent stock idea. Um, won't be a surprise to many of you that it's a, a, sh- a potential short idea, given my general age and grumpiness. Um, but on, on a serious note, I started looking at um, an aerospace equipment um, supplier and manufacturer called Transdime, ticker is TDG, uh, obviously US stock. They, amongst other customers, they are um, a principal supplier um, of aerospace and defense related goods to the Department of Defense in the US. Um, now, this doesn't have, as I said, this is this is the beginning of an idea. So at the moment, it's not even really on my watch list. I'm just looking at it as a potential thing to put on the watch list. Um, it doesn't have the typical profile of our, um, let's call it, you know, for want of a better expression, traditional short ideas in that it has the highest EBITDA margins in its sector. And I'm talking about three times the average double the nearest within the peer group in terms of EBITDA margins of 48%. Um, The next um, best in class company in that sector is a company called Heiko, HEI, which has only got half their margins. Uh, In terms of the valuation um, sort of numbers, we're talking about uh, 2019 P ratio against consensus EPS estimates of 28 times. We're talking in terms of EV, and the reason why enterprise value is an, is, uh, is is a relevant metric here is because, uh, surprise, surprise, this company has got quite a bit of debt, and I'm going to go into the numbers. So they uh, we're talking about a company with a, a prospective 2019 uh, P ratio of 28 times. We're talking about... Um, a $40 billion enterprise value, which is 17 and a half times 2019 consensus EBITDA, which for those of you who are, who are not um, experts on different earnings measures is earnings before interest, tax, depreciation, amortization. Um, in terms of, I, t- I touched on the leverage. So this company is a B-rated company. They have a net debt to EBITDA ratio of 6.5, six and a half times. The average for B-rated companies is five times or just over five times. So on that, on that kind of relative scale, they are um, they're highly levered. Um, now, the reason the margins I, I mention is because this company has been under investigation at periods in the past. Um, most recent one looks at um, 
their government contracts between 2015 and 2017. And the Inspector General of Government Contracts in the US, their preliminary uh, conclusions were that in 46 out of 47 spare parts contracts with the US government, um, the company had earned excess profits. And on some of those, we're talking about thousands of, of basis points. So that's 46 out of 47 contracts. Now, OK, it's a preliminary finding um, and the company has made some noises about, you know, returning some funds and stuff to the government. But we're also now starting to get bipartisan um, commentary. And of course, we're in we're in full election cycle now. Right. So um, you've had Democrats on the House Committee of Oversight and Reform. You've had the chairman of the Senate Committee on Finance, who's actually a Republican. They are requesting further Department of Defense investigation into the pricing practices of Transdime. So, as I say, you know, this is early stage. Um, but, you know, maybe we're looking at a company with uh, well, not maybe we are looking at a company with um, high leverage, very high margins, um, best in class P ratio perspective, forward looking, that now could be coming into some rather serious political um, pressures stroke issues in the peak period for the presidential election build up. Um, so you can see where I'm kind of going with the argument or where I might develop it. But that that's one that, as I say, I, I've just started to look at this week. Um, so I think that could be an interesting situation. And those what, sorts of things can unwind quite quickly when the pin drops for the market, Jason, the, those multiples, obviously reflective of good earnings growth or uh, what the market perceives as good earnings growth most of the time. But when they hit a speed bump like this, uh, that number can get cut quite hard, quite fast. Exactly. And we don't even need to see the actual accident happening in front of us of those margins getting um, not necessarily even crushed, but just coming down. If the market starts to worry about that, as obviously, as you've just pointed out, the, the company will get derated. Um, even before the earnings um, estimates start to drop or the or the margin estimates start to come down. So, yeah, I think, you know, and, you know, we are dealing with a highly politicized environment, which is an understatement at the moment. Um, so, you know, well, obviously, we've got a very sort of interventionist president as well. Um, he hasn't actually, I mean, obviously we know that he's pressurized, um, is it Boeing that makes the, uh, Air Force One? Um, he's pressurized them to get the price down of the new Air Force One, hasn't he? So I don't know whether this is, I mean, I, I don't think you even need Trump to get involved. I mean, the, the fact that you've got bipartisan different committees looking at it in both the House and the Senate and starting to talk about this needs to be investigated further. And obviously, we are in the middle of the election cycle or the peak of it. Yeah, I just think that, um, you know, have we uh, have we got the start of a story here? So, um, of course, it needs to be it's it's often the case that maybe you want to miss the first five or 10 percent of the story and wait for it to actually turn. But I'm just saying, you know, this is something that I've started to look at. And um, if it, it you know, if my work does follow through, then it's definitely going on the watch list. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, let, let's switch back to you just finally, um, Anthony. If you've got any any sort of more macro thoughts to add or stock specific thoughts, I think the macro stuff uh, we've probably covered off pretty well. Um, the, the only stock specific one I'd point out to you guys and our and our viewers would be Nintendo, which was down three and a half percent here in Asia today. Uh, they've had a three to six month delay on one of their key games for Nintendo Switch, uh, Animal Crossings is the name of the game. Haven't played it myself, but by all accounts, it was highly anticipated. I'm just putting this on the very, very early stages of not even on a watch list, but just running it down and, and we'll start to do a little bit of work. Nintendo uh, is a company uh, that could potentially see very strong growth on the back of uh, the Switch platform. There's talk of hardware upgrades uh, to come through as well, although nothing's been announced on that front. So that's really the only interesting one for me. Um, it's 
you know, three and a half percent on one game is pretty punchy. It may be reflective of broader issues, um, but we'll wait and see what happens with that. But yeah, I don't expect the price action to be pretty uh, strong to the upside in in any case uh, in the short term. We'll wait for that weakness to come off while we do our work and and work out if there's an opportunity to look at that one. But that's a that's sort of an interesting one out of Asia today. Okay. Brilliant. Well, those are some excellent thoughts you guys have shared on the show today. So I greatly appreciate having you guys both on. But just before I close the show, it's worth pointing out to you guys watching that all the macro that these guys have put so much emphasis on in this episode is very important to generating solid, fundamentally driven trade ideas. And that's exactly what we teach in our educational courses. So if you're interested in learning that stuff, um, analyzing the markets like these guys do, then you just need to head to our website, itpm.com, and take a look at what we have on offer. As well as educational courses, we've also got mentoring programs available and um, information on all the live seminars that we do around the world. So by all means, check out if there's any local to your area and come along if you can. So that's all we have time for on today's show, but join us next time for another episode of What's On Your Mind.